So welcome everybody and thank you so much for coming here and joining us this evening. I'm sure we'll get some other people drifting in, uh, a few latecomers. I'm Roger Kirby. I'm currently uh, president of the Royal Society of Medicine. Uh, great honour to have that role. And we're here this evening. I'm going to read this from my crib sheet, which I've been given by Michel Acton, our wonderful uh, CEO here. We're here to learn about the latest developments uh, in research, in diagnosis and treatment of painful neuropathies. We've got four fantastic speakers. I've just met them outside. Professor David Bennett uh, is going to chair the session. Uh, Professor Solomon Tesfaye, Fiona Talkington, who I was listening to just the other day on Radio 3 in the afternoons. So she's a Radio, Radio 3 afternoon presenter very often. And Professor Andrew Rice. So welcome, everybody. This evening, our speakers will be providing education on categories and causes of painful neuropathies, some practical advice on diagnostics and screening, and the latest guidance on management and treatment, because it is uh, an infuriating and very difficult condition to treat. We'll be hearing about some personal experiences of those who've lived with painful neuropathy uh, and the challenges that patients face managing their condition and finding the right treatment, often difficult. The session will begin with this perspective, uh, with a patient keynote from Fiona, before we hand over to David, who's going to chair a one-hour discussion between the panel of four speakers. And after this, we'll take questions from Slido, which you can add during the session by visiting the slido.com using the code RSM Neuropathy. Very good code. Following this, we'll open up the questions to questions from the floor. So a special thanks to Alan and Sheila Diamond Charitable Trust for its general generous support, which has enabled free access to this event. Their trust supports a range of charitable organizations, and this funding complements grants it's made to University College of Osteopathy for work in the very same field. We're delighted that Sheila is here this evening Sheila Diamond with us, and uh, we, spend our, send, we send our very best wishes to Alan Diamond, who can't be with us tonight, but is watching at home. And we really appreciate uh, your support. At the end of the session, Jonathan Croatman, trustee of the Charitable Trust, will give a vote of thanks and say a few words on behalf of the Trust, hopefully on time. So welcome now, Fiona. Thank you very much indeed. I'm standing in an art gallery just outside Newcastle. It's the opening of an art exhibition of a Norwegian artist I know very well, and it's a small but very happy occasion. We're all smiling and talking, you know, glass in hand, and I hear a scream. In the distance, gathering momentum, and I know that at any moment that ear-splitting scream will pierce the entire room, shattering the windows and bringing the paintings crashing to the, fall, to the floor. I carry on smiling. No one else can hear that scream. But as it breaks over my body, that is the moment that I know that I need help. I manage to slip off my shoes and hide them under a chair and I carry on smiling. But that moment, the loudest scream that no one heard was a turning point for me. I knew that I was physically unable to do so many things that were or had been part of my life. The burning coal fires in my feet, the feel of fierce iron grips around my legs, the wanting to unzip the skin around my body and feel it breathe again. I knew that I needed help. Thank you for inviting me here tonight. My story is one of shock and fear, of kindness and support, of sadness, of pain, of help and friendship, of warmth and understanding, and of coldness and discrimination. There's a lovely poem, I don't know if you know it, by Carol Ann Duffy. It's called Words, Wide Nights. It's actually a love poem, but its final line haunts me. It reads, this is what it is like, or what it is like in words. And that's what I can give you tonight, only my words. 
which I hope may, along with the wisdom and experience of my colleagues here tonight, nurture your own understanding of the world of painful neuropathies. That moment in Newcastle came, I seem to remember, not that long after I'd eventually finished regular hospital treatment for breast cancer. In 2008, I'd found a lump, I'd undergone surgery, a mastectomy and immediate reconstruction. Uh, I was HER2 positive, so I needed chemotherapy, followed by a further year of Herceptin infusions on the chemo ward uh, every three weeks, which uh, I understand are now given uh, much more simply. Um, it was a bit of a bumpy ride. Um, neutropenic sepsis stands out as being very frightening and isolating, but eventually my three weekly visits to the hospital came to an end. The hospital still saw me regularly, and I began to mention the terrible cramps that I was getting, and this really weird feeling in my feet, and that I generally felt so uncomfortable, and I'd lost the ability to sweat. My consultant laughed and said that I was lucky, as I'd keep the heating bills down. I wonder what he'd say in these days. As for the cramps, more gin and tonic, preferably more tonic than gin. I wasn't that amused. Something wasn't right. Working as a broadcaster and as a freelancer, I had to keep going, but it was very hard to get sympathy and understanding from anyone. After all, I looked perfectly well. Eventually, oncology referred me to a neurologist, and I learned the words peripheral neuropathy. You've got the feet of an 80-year-old, and it'll get worse over years probably, not months, he said. He prescribed gabapentin and said that if that didn't suit, there were plenty of other drugs and that the pain consultants would look after me. And there were other departments I saw as well as chemo had taken its toll on various bits of me. But it was the neuropathic pain that caused the most noise. And that was the hardest to explain to anybody and for which I received the least understanding or sympathy. Medication wasn't doing anything other than causing awful side effects. Fast forward, and I rejected, very politely, the offer of ketamine, which they said would make me feel as though I had permanent bladder infections and that I would have hallucinations which would be green. They just weren't selling it. Meanwhile, back at the cold face of work, I had uh, different sorts of battles. I'm sure you know and that many people I, I know have been faced with, oh, it's great that you're all better now as soon as you finish treatment. I volunteered for a while with a cancer charity working with people on a moving forward course and it was among the most often talked about phrases. And we worked on finding words, how to use these words in response, having handy phrases up our sleeves, finding words as our armory to face a non-understanding world. I'm a big fan of the writing of Virginia Woolf, and uh, she often has thoughts to pass on to me. English, she wrote, which can express the thoughts of Hamlet and the tragedy of Lear, has no words for the shiver and the headache. The merest schoolgirl, when she falls in love, has Shakespeare or Keats to speak her mind for her but let a sufferer try to describe a pain in his head to a doctor and language at once runs dry. But you're not in pain now, people say, as I'm interviewing them or just having a chat. Ask me, I say. Ask me what I'm feeling. And if you were to ask me now, I would say that my legs are like blocks of ice, but they're heavy. And there's like a six lane motorway in each leg. Do you know the film Koyani Skatsi, the Francis Ford Coppola film from the early 1980s? And there's that scene where the, uh, these huge American highways with the traffic going faster and faster in all the lanes. That's how I can describe it, how I'm trying to describe it. Um, the volume is high. I, I try and think of my pain as, as a volume and I want to turn it down, but it's like an orchestra where, where the strings are, are 
playing out of tune. They're pressing heavily on the bows. They're scratching. Um, and, and I want them to turn this volume down, but they just turn their backs on me. And it's as if there's a whole orchestra with all the instruments playing in different rooms and I can't make my voice heard. In my working world, an ever-changing media world, I was faced with the icy blast of change to which I had to respond that I simply could not do that, that I was in too much pain and that it would cause too much pain. My oncologist and other members of my team backed me up, but to no avail. It wouldn't be appropriate for me to go into great details here, but the anxiety and the hurt and the pain of not being understood made me think that I would rather go through chemo again than to endure the pain of not being understood. Having declined the hospital's final offer of ketamine, I thought that that was it, but I felt that somewhere there must be people for whom peripheral neuropathy was a speciality, even if I just offered myself for research. After all, I hadn't had the classic neuropathy symptoms while on chemo was something that only emerged afterwards. My saviour came in the shape of a rat, or the image of a lab rat on a screen at the Encountering Pain conference at UCL in 2016. It was one of the best lectures that I've ever heard anywhere about anything. There was an image of a rat with induced peripheral neuropathy, bright blue and red in front of me. And in that moment, I felt validated. What I had was actually real. I asked the speaker if she knew anyone I could write to, and of course she did. And that soon led me to a meeting at which that all important thing happened once again. I felt understood. I can't emphasize too much what that actually means. I'd given up trying to explain to friends. I was still carrying the hurt and the bitter discrimination from within work situations. It was something that's alive and happening to so many people to this day. I bent over backwards to explain hidden disabilities to people. On behalf of others, I've pointed out numerous times that under the 2010 Equality Act, uh, anyone who is diagnosed with cancer uh, is legally classed as disabled from day one of diagnosis. And many people won't need to call upon this, but for many, many others, that protection does exist. Unless you're so afraid of employment situations that you daren't tell anyone. It doesn't make you feel any better to put your head above the parapet, but I keep doing it and hope that somebody will understand. Of course, there was no magic pill or potion, but I have learned so much. There are people doing the most incredible things with pain management. And there are focus groups and courses and therapies and therapists making a huge difference. But, and a slight niggle here, many of the helpful books and pamphlets do have a feel about them that people don't have to work or care for others. Being understood and communicating your pain, how to feel understood. That Encountering Pain conference was built around the great research done by Deborah Padfield about using images to communicate your pain. How many of us have looked at the pain scale questionnaires in waiting rooms and not had a clue what 7.2 or 9.3 or 6.4 actually means? Wrapped up in that is the pain we feel, the effect it has on what we do, how we can earn our living and how we can have a social life, have our self-confidence, our identity and how we're treated by anxiety. I'm going to end with some words that I wrote that have spoken to some people and as I reread them, I think, yeah, this is how I feel. It's called Off the Scale. On a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 is the quietest, barely audible, and 10 is the loudest, thank you, I say, interrupting, as you look at me kindly, head tilted to one side, thank you for trying to understand me. The quietest, feather light, soft, touches my skin, and I feel each blade of the bird's wing cut silently, drawing blood, stinging, 
take it away, make it stop. Climbing each stair with dread, I am a cacophonous interruption to the world. Each step, a wild animal whose jaws shred my feet greedily. Ten is the loudest. It is a blackbird owning the evening air, oblivious to anything but its own song woven across the summer months. But all that I can hear is the raucous, mocking sound of my own body, so loud that I mouth the words, make it stop, make it stop. <coughs> Find me another scale, the pelog and slendro of Indonesia, the long breath of an Indian rag, an exotic pentatonic, a scale that beckons another world. You throw a dice, I can't see the numbers. <coughs> Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much. That was a great start to this session, really. I think it's so important for us to understand the impact of pain on people living with it. Uh, the, the difficulty in communicating pain, which came across so clearly, uh, its impact on every aspect of life. And, you know, some of your own experiences are so commonly experienced by, by our patients, the, the difficulties that we have with medication, some of the side effects, and lack of efficacy. So I think we all agree this is a tremendous problem that we want to solve uh, within medical science. And, you know, we hope to have an interactive uh, session today. So I, I, there's going to be four of us. I'm going to chair, so you have the disadvantage of a chair that's also speaking, which can always be dangerous uh, in workshops. I will try and control myself and, and my colleagues so that we try and keep to time. We're going to make this somewhat organic and uh, interactive between us for an hour. Uh, and then we will be taking questions. Um, there will be two formats of questions. You, you will be able to answer them via the slider tool, or you can just put your hand up and we'll use the traditional microphones. I'll, I'll be happy to deal with both of those. Just again, to kind of reiterate our aims, well, we want to give you some understanding of the pathophysiology of painful neuropathy, but we want to make this clinically practical. So we'll also be talking about some of the screening tools, some of the uh, diagnostics that can be applied to painful neuropathy, and of course, how we can better manage painful neuropathy. And so we'll be taking advantage of this grouped experience amongst us, um, and hopefully, you know, we'll be keeping us honest from the, as it were, the lived experience of pain, and, and you know, do feel free, you know, if, if we're not making uh, things clean, clear uh, between us. Okay, so I, I think uh, without further ado, maybe we should start by introducing ourselves. So maybe I'll start at the far end of, of the stage. Um, and Andrew, would you like to just ha have a few words introducing yourself and your background? You mean, I'm Andrew Rice. I'm Professor of Pain Research at Imperial College London and also a consultant in pain medicine at Chelsea and Westminster. Uh, I'm particularly interested in neuropathic pain. That's all I do. So if I start talking about musculoskeletal pain, take it with a pinch of salt, because I won't know what I'm talking about. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the context of infectious diseases, HIV, herpes zoster, leprosy, and HTLV-1, also in diabetic neuropathy. And we work quite a lot with the military on uh, consequences in uh, particularly veterans. Um, I would actually also like to acknowledge that we have funding from the Allen and Sheila Diamond Trust, and it's great to see Sheila here tonight, that's to look at um, how we obtain best evidence for non-pharmacological treatments of neuropathic pain, and that's a collaboration with the University College of Osteopathy, and it's wonderful to see their Vice-Chancellor here, uh, Charles Hunt. Um, so thank you, David. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Fiona. Oh, thank you. Well, you already know um, far more about me than, than a lot of <laughs> other people do. Um, but uh, by, by, I should say, by, you know, by day or night, um, I'm a, a broadcaster by profession and uh, a writer, and I do things like curating festivals of music <coughs> here or in Norway, um, you know, various things. It, and, but it's become a passion of mine to, to bring um, to the attention of others working towards a sympathetic understanding of painful neuropathies. Um, so 
the, the, the vast area of, of people from all sorts of backgrounds may be able to look forward with some positivity. So thank you again for including me tonight. Thanks, Fiona. And Solomon? Uh, I'm Solomon Tesfaye, a diabetologist. I work in Sheffield. I'm also honorary professor of diabetes medicine at the University of Sheffield. I have an interest in the management and pathophysiology of uh, neuropathic pain in diabetes. Um, we also have a national center for, for patients coming in, referred 50% of our patients come from outside Sheffield with uh, difficult, painful diabetic neuropathy. So I have a little bit of experience managing uh, uh, these patients. Thank you, Solomon. And uh, just to finish with myself, so I'm Professor of Neurology and I'm Head of the Division of Clinical Neurology at the University of Oxford. And like all of our panel, I, I have a long-standing interest in understanding neuropathic pain and hopefully trying to improve the management of neuropathic pain. Um, I, I've collaborated in various ways with all, all members of the, of the panel today. And at the moment, I'm uh, leading a national consortium called Painstorm, which is very much focusing on neuropathic pain. I run a, a clinic, and so I'll be spending my tomorrow, uh, all tomorrow, in a neuropathy clinic, as well as undertaking uh, research. And uh, my interests are very broad, uh, but they include some very rare genetic causes of neuropathic pain, but spanning much more common causes, such as diabetic neuropathy as well. Okay, so I think uh, we've introduced ourselves, and maybe we can, uh, the way we thought we would do this, so we, we have mapped out the general areas that we want to cover over uh, the next 55 minutes. Uh, and I thought it would be helpful if maybe as a neurologist, I started in how does a, a neurologist think about peripheral neuropathy? So we're talking, obviously, the folks will be ultimately painful peripheral neuropathy, but I thought it'd be helpful to give a framework so that we all kind of, as it were, were speaking the same language. So peripheral neuropathy, what, what is a peripheral neuropathy? Well, it really refers to damage to the peripheral neurons, which are those neurons that provide connectivity between the spinal cord and the body. It's common. Uh, it's difficult to give you an exact figure. Uh, estimates would be around 6 to 8%, uh, particularly of the population over 50, will have uh, peripheral neuropathy. It's going to become more common, uh, and that's because uh, we have a worldwide epidemic of diabetes, which is an important cause. We have an aging population, um, and we have uh, more cancer survival, which is a, which is a good thing. Uh, but uh, the use of chemotherapy, as we've so eloquently heard, can be a trigger for peripheral neuropathy. What, what are, you know, if we're going to break down the causes, well, in broad terms, uh, as I've said, diabetes mellitus is a very common cause of peripheral neuropathy, as are toxins, whether those are in the form of self-administered toxins, such as alcohol, or drugs that we as doctors have administered to patients. Uh, infection is another important cause, certainly worldwide, so Andrew's introduced the, the point that HIV is an important cause of peripheral neuropathy, and certainly in the developing world, leprosy remains uh, an important cause of peripheral neuropathy. Dysfunction of the immune system, and that may be part of uh, a, a kind of a generalized uh, disorder, such as connective tissue disorder or vasculitis. It may be quite specific immune-based causes of neuropathy, such as Guillain-Barré syndrome. There are genetic causes of peripheral neuropathy, and the, the generic term for those would be charcot marie tooth and also malignancy in itself can cause peripheral neuropathy through a number of mechanisms, which I don't have time to go into detail uh, at the moment, but I can take questions about later. It should be remembered, even after working extremely hard to understand the underlying cause of a peripheral neuropathy, there's a significant group that remain idiopathic. We can't find an underlying cause. That tends to be particularly with slow onset neuropathies in uh, the population over 60, uh, and I suspect in that case there are multifactorial causes to the peripheral neuropathy. I think it's fair to say that all of those causes I've just mentioned can cause a painful neuropathy, but the likelihood of that neuropathy being painful can vary depending on the underlying cause of the neuropathy. So, for instance, in diabetes, in, a, in those patients that have neuropathy, in around 30 to 50 percent of cases, it will be painful. Some of those genetic causes of neuropathy, such as, for instance, amyloid neuropathy or hereditary sensory neuropathy type 1, almost 100% of patients will experience disabling pain. 
how do I, as a neurologist, categorize neuropathy? Well, I think just to give you some principles, I'm not going to give you a full lecture on neuropathy, you'd be pleased to say it here, uh, but we can break down the types of nerve fibers in peripheral nerves into three. One is motor nerve fibers, so they're providing signals to, to the muscles, and they will cause particular symptoms, which would be weakness, muscle weightness, wasting, fatigue. The second major group of nerve fibers is sensory neurons. Those are particularly relevant because damage to those sensory neurons can cause positive sensory phenomenon, such as pain, pins and needles, and also if they're not working properly, you may get negative symptoms such as numbness or impaired temperature sensation. And then the third broad group of peripheral neurons is the autonomic fibers, often forgotten, but those are very important in the unconscious control of bodily functions. So Fiona mentioned that she lost the ability to sweat. That is dependent on the autonomic nervous system, as is control of the gastrointestinal tract, the bladder, blood pressure. So these can have very profound effects on patients if they're dysfunctional. Now, people may present with a predominant neuropathy of one of those types of nerve fibers, all very commonly combinations. And you'll hear the term polyneuropathy, and really that's referring to the fact that a type of neuropathy in which all of those nerve fibers are affected. The other term you might hear in the next hour will be small fiber neuropathy. And that's really referring to the fact that if you would take a cross section of a nerve and look at it under very high power, the smallest nerve fibers are the sensory fibers carrying pain and temperature, as well as the autonomic fibers. And so small fiber neuropathy is very often painful. In the vast majority of cases, it's painful. And there may be autonomic symptoms as well. I'm just going to briefly touch on the point that if you speak to a neurologist, particularly a neurologist, I'm afraid, about neuropathy, you may hear this term of axonal versus demyelinating neuropathy. I wouldn't obsess about that this evening. It is helpful in discriminating the underlying cause of a neuropathy. And normally, the way that we define a neuropathy as being axonal demyelinating is that you can think of nerves in simple terms as a wire. Uh, the central core of that wire, they say the copper core, is the axon, and it has an insulating sheath, uh, as it were, the rubber coating of a wire, uh, which the technical term for which we would cause myelin, call myelin. So uh, an axonal neuropathy is where the copper core is affected. The myelinating neuropathy is where the insulating sheath, the myelin, is affected. And we can differentiate those two things using tests such as nerve conduction studies. When we are, are talking to someone that's suffering peripheral neuropathy and, and assessing them clinically, what we want to know is the distribution of the affected nerves. Most common neuropathies are length dependent, and what that means is the longest nerves in our body are those nerves to the feet. So in the vast majority of cases, the first symptoms will be in the feet. We want to know if that neuropathy is symmetrical, affected both sides of the body equally, for instance, or asymmetrical. We want to know about the speed of onset. So a neurologist is going to get more concerns the more quickly a neuropathy develops. <coughs> I'm not going to take you through the whole clinical pathway, but neurologists will follow the good practice of clinical medicine, which is they will take a history from the patient. They'll be thinking about what the underlying causes of neuropathy might be. They'll be thinking what treatments might they be on that will have predisposed them to a neuropathy. They'll be asking about family history and factors such as uh, alcohol intake. They will then examine the patient, and they will then order investigations appropriate for that clinical presentation. And that might be a series of blood tests. In many, but not necessarily all cases, it would be nerve conduction studies. And in very select cases, they might do some more specific investigations, such as a skin biopsy, to physically count the number of small nerve fibers when they're investigating a small fiber neuropathy. Very, very rarely, we very rarely do them now, would they do a nerve biopsy. And generally, it's something to be avoided in a painful neuropathy. But in certain contexts, we might do that. So just to summarize, I've tried to give you a framework of how we think about peripheral neuropathy. Virtually almost all the causes of peripheral neuropathy can result in a painful neuropathy, but the frequency of that pain will vary. As a neurologist, we often think about the particular nerve fibers that are affected, and that's because those are predictive of the clinical symptoms of the person presenting to you with peripheral neuropathy. And we want to know about the distribution of those clinical presentation and the speed of onset. So I'm hoping that just gives you something of a framework on which to hang the subsequent discussion. So, so Andrew, I've spoken a bit about peripheral neuropathy. How, as you said, you're particularly interested in neuropathic pain and you're, you're a 
anaesthetist and a, a pain physician. So how would you tackle the diagnosis of someone in terms of understanding their neuropathic pain? Thank you, Dave. Uh, and first of all, the concept of a diagnosis here is something to be a little bit aware of because neuropathic pain is a syndrome. It's a collection of symptoms and clinical signs. Um, there are people who will believe that it's a disease in its own right. I think that's taking it a little too far. But certainly what it is, is an is a, um, aberrant response of the sensory nervous system uh, to an injury or lesion. I think the other thing to be aware of is the clinical scenario in which it presents. Dave has outlined some of those, so be alert to that possibility. But there's also the converse, that not everybody with a neuropathy has pain. And in fact, for example, some of our patients living with HIV clearly have a neuropathy, but in fact, the cause of pain in their feet is their arthropathy. Um, but the starting point we would generally use is the International Association Study of Pain definition of neuropathic pain, which is just from the beginning of this year, actually, been included by the WHO in the ICD-11. And that is um, pain caused by a lesion or disease of the somatosensory system. So it's the somatosensory system. So the basis of this is you have to show that there's a lesion or disease of the somatosensory system. And we probably spend a lot of our time undiagnosing neuropathic pain. We get referrals that this patient has neuropathic type symptoms, and I don't really know what that means. But together with Dave and several others, we put together about five years ago now, uh, an algorithm that sits within the conventional uh, clinical process. So the first stage is um, the patient would have to um, have their symptoms, and you can get this by drawing a body map for, or getting the patient to draw a body map of where their symptoms are in what we call, call a, um, a neuroanatomically plausible location. So in other words, it would have to be in a single dermatome, like for post neuralgia, in a single peripheral nerve, like the ulnar nerve in leprosy, or as Dave has suggested, uh, a distal symmetrical glove and stocking distribution, classical of a, a length-dependent axonal neuropathy. And if they, their symptoms correspond to one of those, or indeed perhaps the, the, hemi, the distinct hemicorporeal presentation of someone with thalamic syndrome, uh, you, you've reached what we call the possible stage. To move on from the possible stage, you need to demonstrate abnormal sensory signs uh, in the same neuroanatomically plausible location. So do they have sensory loss or gain? And it is a cause of frustration to me that how many patients I see presenting to our clinic, a tertiary clinic, when I'm told, oh, you're actually the first doctor who's examined me uh, for this. And that's, I think, somewhat distressing. But if you can show the... Um, uh, um, the presence of abnormal sensory signs in that location, you get to what we call probable neuropathic pain. And for example, when we're working in low and middle income countries, uh, that's sufficient really to proceed with it. And the third stage, which we call definite, is to demonstrate um, the presence of the lesion or disease by definitive investigations. That might be an MRI scan, uh, demonstrating a thalamic stroke, for example, uh, or nerve conduction studies. But th th there is a pitfall here uh, that just because you have normal nerve conduction studies doesn't mean you can exclude a sensory neuropathy. Dave has um, alluded to uh, the presence of small fiber neuropathies, which can present with um, normal nerve conduction studies. And in that situation, we would uh, probably perform a skin biopsy to look at the epidermal innovation uh, and perform uh, quantitative sensory testing, for example. Um, so that's a very medicalized part of it. But as you've eloquently heard from Fiona, that's only part of the story. And then the final part is to ascertain what the impact is on that patient's quality of life of neuropathic pain. We call that the burden of disease. And there are a number of approaches we have from there. But we now have a, a, quite a good structure in the ICD-11 definition and, and a structure around that uh, for diagnosing neuropathic pain, possible, probable and definite, and if any of you want signposting to the papers um, outlining that, I'm happy to do so. Yeah. Um, and Andrew, you said that um, it wasn't a diagnosis, and uh, patients very often uh, come wanting a diagnosis because you actually need 
to, to fit into yeah. the boxes of the, the outside world. How, when patients say, but, but what is my diagnosis? What do I go from here? How do I tell people what's, what's going on? Um, how do you signpost them? So perhaps I was a little bit too firm there, but <laughs> we're, we're diagnosing the pain, but diagnosis to many doctors means diagnosing the underlying disease. Mm. So sometimes the patients will come to us with an underlying disease with chemotherapy-induced neuropathy, for example, but sometimes that, that can be their presentation. Uh, but we can tell you what the mechanism of your pain is, and if you like, that's a mm. diagnosis, and explain quite a lot about what neuropathic pain is. And I think mm. that can sometimes be quite uh, reassuring to someone that we recognise what they're talking about. How can you possibly feel pain where you're numb, for example? Okay. That's clearly a quite a difficult concept to grasp. Um, uh, so explanation uh, and accurately classifying your pain and giving you reassurance as to what it's caused by mm. and that we recognise that is quite an important step. Yes, ab ab absolutely. As, as I mentioned earlier on, knowing that it was real, yes. that, that, just having that valid validation, but it's a long process. You used the term the hidden disability, which is one we increasingly yes, refer to. Yes. Pain is one of the hidden disabilities. And I mean, maybe, again, I'll, I'll stick with you, Andrew. I, and and you, you've mentioned it um, in your presentation, which is that some patients with, this, with a neuropathy will develop pain in some way. And I mean, actually, that's something that we we don't fully understand, but, but would you like to kind of muse on some ideas as to, as to what it is that predisposes some people to developing pain and others not? Um, there's a short and a long answer. <laughs> the short answer is... Maybe you can take a middle road. I'll take the middle road. <laughs> the short answer is we don't know, but the long answer is it's one, or longer answer, it's one of the most exciting and important questions facing this field at the moment. Why do some patients... So roughly 20... Um, Solomon may correct me if I'm wrong... Roughly 25% of people with diabetic neuropathy experience significant life-impacting pain. Uh, about 20% of people who've had herpes zoster will develop post neuralgia. 25% of people with leprosy will have significant neuropathic pain. And we, we really don't understand why some people do and some people don't. There's lots of theories. I'm not going to be brave enough to talk about the genetics while I'm sharing the platform with David Bennett. I'm sure he'll talk about that. Um, but what is becoming increasingly apparent is that some of the biggest predictive factors or, or associated factors are um, psychosocial in nature. Um, and we've obviously got a lot of collaborations with psychologists trying to understand what those are at the moment. Um, but I'm going to hand back to you because I'm not going to say anything about genetics. <laughs> okay, I, I mean, so I think you're right, actually. I, I think probably my, my own view is that this is very much a multifactorial issue. There isn't, there's, there's no single answer. There's probably multiple mechanisms driving neuropathic pain in any one person. Um, so it's not even as simple to say that we can map specific mechanisms to specific yeah. people. I think there are many interacting factors. Uh, I, it's true that I am interested in genetics. And I, and I think there have been some examples um, in, in the field of neuropathic pain, which make it clear that it is very possible that in, in rare cases, uh, a, a gene mutation can be entirely responsible for a neuropathic pain state. So uh, I look after people suffering from rare disorders such as erythromyalgia, which is, I have a patient that was born with painful feet and, and red feet, and that pro progressed throughout her life. Uh, and erythromyalgia, in the typical medical terminology, is, is Latin for painful red extremities. Uh, and she suffered from very disabling uh, pain, and that's a familial condition. Uh, and that is entirely due to a gain-of-function mutation in an iron channel uh, that makes that iron channel hyperactive. And essentially, that iron channel is selectively expressed in central neurons, particularly nociceptors, and the activity of that channel is making them fire all the time. And uh, that firing is increased by temperature, and her pain is much made much worse by warmth and relieved by cooling. And so th those kind of very rare cases show us that in certain individuals, genetics can have very powerful effects. Uh, and actually, I would say it, it's kind of, it, in a way, it, from what you've been saying, Fiona, it, 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 is I think um, sometimes doctors shy away from very complex problems. And in a way, having a very clear genetic cause has 
somehow engage the medical profession in understanding, well, there's very clear biology that we can get our teeth into and understand and, and a very clear link between a particular function of a gene and a protein and how that causes pain in people. And so that has inspired the field, uh, both in terms of understanding pain and also trying to, to develop new ways to block pain by targeting that particular ion channel. So that's a kind of very rare condition, but I think what it has meant is in the neuropathic pain field that people have then said, okay, well, maybe we should look at that same ion channel in much more common uh, disorders such as painful diabetic neuropathy. And in fact, we are seeing some links where <coughs> variants, so they're not as having such a powerful effect, they're having more subtle effects on ion channel function, but variants in that same ion channel can predispose people to develop painful diabetic neuropathy. So they can live their, whole, their life pre the development of diabetes, they don't have excess pain, but then there's this interaction between the metabolic environment, probably also um, the way their brain is wired, their previous experience, and that gene variant, and then that can trigger off pain, as it were, in vulnerable individuals. So I, so I think genetics has given us some insight. It's definitely not going to be the whole answer. I don't want people to leave the room with the wrong impression. I, I honestly think this is a multifactorial uh, issue. Uh, but I think it's been helpful, and it's also help, helped us identify potential new treatment targets for neuropathic pain. And, and I think that it's undoubtedly true that at the end of the day, I feel that pain is very complex, but it is an issue of excess excitability in the nervous system. And, and part of that excess excitability is driven by ion channels, and so identifying the genetic hyperactivity in some of those ion channels has been very helpful. So that's my brief pennyworth on, on genetics. I don't know if you want to add yeah. to that, Solomon. Uh, I was always intrigued by why some patients have disabling, quite devastating neuropathic pain, can't sleep at night, quality of life extremely terrible, social isolation, depression, anxiety. Um, eloquently put by Fiona earlier on, and others with the same degree of neuropathy have absolutely no pain. How is that possible? That was the, uh, my old boss, Professor John Ward, who trained me in diabetic neuropathy, who was the vice president of the college, uh, always said, the power of observation, observe patients. Clinical research grows out of being a very busy clinician. And the question then was to see the epidemiology. What are the risk factors? So we followed 3,250 patients from 17 European countries, 31 centers, for seven years. We identified risk factors for diabetic peripheral neuropathy. It, diabetic peripheral neuropathy is driven not only by glucose and changing glucose over the seven year period, but also by vascular risk factors, high blood pressure, cholesterol, um, uh, obesity. These are drivers of neuropathy. We then looked what causes pain? Well, what are the risk factors of painful neuropathy? Those that develop incident painful neuropathy at seven years. You couldn't reduce it to any metabolic factor. Pain is highly complex. There was nothing that we could find that predicted the development of painful neuropathy. And as was indicated, the social factors, psychological factors, um, genetic factors, I'm sure, it is a multifactorial thing which is driving. We found a slight ex excess in females um, in, in the, the chronic pain. But the question is, and we also found various associations, but there was nothing that, that predicted the development of neuropathy, painful neuropathy. We then went on to do, just if I have a, a minute to, uh, to, to develop this, that psychological factors were very important. Many patients actually examine them. You can find nothing. You do clinical examination, it's perfectly normal. They are having pain. And they, these people are not crazy. They, they, they have got pain, but we cannot, we do not, when you examine their reflexes, everything is perfect. You do skin barks, it comes normal, everything comes normal. But they give you the perfect description of neuropathic pain. And that really triggered my interest that the problem of pain could be triggered maybe from the periphery but a lot of the problem is in the central nervous system. The pain that we have, the continuous pain, is making some changes in the central nervous system. And a lot of our uh, publications 
since then, uh, we just had a, a review article in Nature recently, you might have seen it, uh, showing that this is what's triggering this, um, this pain or the uh, continuity of the pain, the chronicity of the pain is driven by some of these changes in, in the, we will develop, maybe when, when there are questions, I don't want to, we've got a lot of other things to cover today, but uh, we've found functional abnormalities in key areas like the uh, thalamus, not just doing functional, but using spectroscopy. Uh, we've found changes in um, cortical uh, thickness in the somatosensory cortex with very chronic, I'm talking about chronic pain for many, and we also found differences in how pain is processed in the key brain areas uh, in different pain phenotypes of uh, diabetic neuropathy. So um, I think I'll stop there, but uh, perhaps we could open this up maybe later. Thanks, Solomon. Yeah, I, I think it, it is a fear. Um, I was just going to ask, do, do we know uh, to what extent there are differences um, between uh, those who present with painful neuropathies from a diabetic background, from chemo-induced, uh, or all the other various backgrounds, are there specific differences, or is this a, a whole range yet to be discovered? In my opinion, I think I, I have a picture which shows, you know, sort of, there's a Mona Lisa, but it looks different to different. So there are generic things that are very similar in some of the, for instance, chemotherapy-induced mm -hmm. pain. It's very similar. We uh, use patients with chemotherapy-induced as, as our pain control group, the similarity with diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Um, but there are also key features of each condition. Mm -hmm. and, and so there is the generic, but also there's individual aspects. And uh, we need to crack what, make, what, is it, what makes the particular pain uh, problem unique. What are the features that are actually are different, mm -hmm. that differentiate it from the other, uh, the other conditions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with completely agree with Solomon. There. So there's some common features, but but there can be some very specific features, particularly neuropathy. So, for instance, mm -hmm. with oxaliplatin-induced neuropathy, it's a chemotherapeutic agent. Um, you can get a very characteristic symptom where people find cold extremely unpleasant. So if you get mm -hmm. a cold hypersensitivity um, that you mm -hmm. is much less common, for instance, in diabetic neuropathy, or the patients with erythromelalgia I was telling you about is exquisitely temperature sensitive. So warmth absolutely triggers off. So we've seen kind of temperature having completely opposite effects mm. on those two different neuropathic mm. conditions. So although they make, there are some features that are common, there are some that are, are also distinct. Mm. Yeah, I've, I've just returned from a trip to Australia and our colleagues there came up with a typically Australian pragmatic diagnostic test for the cold allodynia, which is uh, if you can't hold your beer can uh, anymore, you've probably got cold allodynia. <laughs> No stereotype in there at all, Andrew. <laughs> okay, so I, I think maybe we'll move on a little bit from um, diagnostics and causation to care pathways. So maybe we can move on to that topic. Solomon, it, we've spoken a bit about diabetic neuropathy. What, what do you think is the best way to screen for diabetic neuropathy? I think that's a very important question, and that. Uh, really, diabetic peripheral neuropathy and neuropathic pain is a Cinderella of, of all diabetic complications, such as retinopathy, nephropathy, are uh, infinitely more considered to be more sexy than diabetic peripheral neuropathy. In fact, what causes the, the biggest danger to a patient is having diabetic peripheral neuropathy. I always wonder why is that? Because I mean, everyone says that. Well, I'll come to that. It, 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 it is. If many patients who have diabetic peripheral neuropathy who um, develop a foot ulcer have a life expectancy within five years, 50%, around 40 to 55% uh, will unfortunately die. If you have an amputation in one leg, um, your life expectancy five, uh, for five is about 70% will die within five years. Um, the reason is diabetic peripheral neuropathy is linked with vascular risk factors, but also there are the patient factors, uh, the huge disability, poorly understood. And many patients who come to see me, the more I get out of my chair, I, there's no 10, 15 minutes, I give them a full hour because they come at the tertiary, the hospital has agreed to do that. I said, I'm not gonna see a patient in 15 minutes. You can't possibly understand 
what they go through there. And, and, and it, it, so it's the complexity of these conditions. And so to start off, there are a few points I would like to make that really we're doing badly in, in the UK. In fact, in the whole of Europe. The first is there is an underdiagnosis um, and undertreatment. If you underdiagnose a condition, you undertreat. So approximately one in two patients that have painful diabetic neuropathy are not diagnosed in the UK. This is in a very developed country. Whereas retinopathy, uh, everybody has an annual eye screening. We diagnose it and it's, it's outside the doctor's, outside our, our hand as it were. They, they go through, uh, we used to fiddle with ophthalmoscope many years ago. We don't do that anymore. Uh, annual eye screening, digital camera based, early referral, early being seen, early treatment, game changer. Retinopathy is no longer the commonest cause of working age blindness. But nobody asks patients if they have painful neuropathy. And um, a study done in Liverpool, um, this is many years, 2005, by Daosi and colleagues, um, showed that about 12.5% never actually were never asked if they have, they were never asked if they have pain. And around 40% didn't have any medications for it. Around 15 years, uh, 2022, we did a survey in four countries, and this is going to be presented in the IDF, in uh, the UK, uh, Spain, um, Netherlands, uh, and Germany. And we found exactly the same. These are patients, this is patient voice, so the thing we did was we contacted patients that have painful neur neuropathy, and we asked them, you know, how they were diagnosed, and we, so it was like a survey in these four different countries, a really well-powered study. And it showed that one in two uh, were not diagnosed. And they, nobody listens to them, when, when nobody listens to patients when they say, I've got pain, um, they just ignore it or they, and, and so approximately 50% are only diagnosed properly. Um, they are, and this obviously leads to patient suffering and, and uh, uh, you know, the referral pathways are not very well constructed. Um, if you go to see a GP in the UK and you say you are a diabetic person, person with diabetes, uh, you know, they'll ask you if you've got blood pressure, cholesterol, everything is done, but nobody says, do you have pain? It's a very simple thing. It's not in the template. It's not in the diagnostic template of general practitioners. Um, that some GPs have a small, it says, do you have pain? It's not it's generic. It doesn't say what kind of pain you have. Do you have it in both legs? It doesn't, it's not that properly worked out. So it's completely ignored. Um, and the clinical examination that's done on patients is poor. We use inappropriate diagnostic uh, tools such as 10 gram monofilament. Um, Ralph Abrahams, he's, uh, he's the one that taught me that, so how to examine the diabetic foot sitting right in, in there many years ago. Um, and we're still using the, the monofilament. It's a stone age uh, sort of implement. It's a good way of diagnosing patients that have a risk for foot ulceration, but it's not a good way of diagnosing neuropathy early. Um, so there is underdiagnosis of the peripheral neuropathy. We give them false reassurance, false sense of security. You're okay, you can feel the monofilament. They're not okay. The neuropathy is progressing year on year. By the time they can feel the monofilament, the neuropathy is so advanced, they go to the foot clinic. When they arrive at the foot clinic, game over, within five years, 50% will, will unfortunately pass away. So this is really awful. So how do we tackle this? We've, not, we've tackled this in Sheffield in a completely different way, and we did manage to persuade our CCG, which is great. It's very difficult to do that. The best way to persuade your CCGs to say, we'll save you some money. <laughs> That's what works with them. Correct. And, 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 and it's worked. So now in Sheffield, we have four hubs, GP hubs, where patients have a one-stop shop. So patients go uh, to these uh, hubs. They have eye screening. They, everybody comes for eye screening. Uh, it's a high uptake, 85%. People are scared of going blind. Um, but sort of the feet and other aspects are the other eight care processes people with diabetes have blood pressure cholesterol smoking etc are um, only occurring about 40 percent all of these occur in 40 percent this massive 
reduction in uptake. So what we've done is a one-stop shop. They have everything done. But the neuropathy we screen not with monofilament, but with a handheld device called uh, DPN check. We measure serial sensory conduction velocity and amplitude. Within three minutes, you get a quantitative uh, number of the severity of neuropathy, if there is, instead of present or absent, very crude, the monofilament. And we also do, for small fiber assessment, we do the pseudo scan. It measures pseudomotor function, small fiber feature. So we use this plus a foot exam, um, a quick foot exam, a three minute foot exam. So what we found using this, we also do a um, DN4 questionnaire, which takes two minutes to see if they have neuropathic pain. And by doing that, we found amazing results. First of all, we diagnosed 25% new diagnosis of painful neuropathy. These are previously undiagnosed. And this has been published by Binz Hall et al. in 2018 in Diabetic Medicine, you can see it. Um, and, and what we, we, 25%, and these are treatment requiring patients with painful neuropathy, immediately referred to our multidisciplinary MDT, painful neuropathy service. Um, we also found if you use the monofilament, you diagnose neuropathy in only 14%. But if you use the DPN check, which measures nerve conduction, you diagnose neuropathy in 51%. So it tells us that we're using really, we, we need to move to the 21st century. We need to use, ultimately, this is going to save us money. And, and so these services being offered, the people that have abnormal nerve conduction are actually people that have very poor glucose control. So that means you diagnose them, well, you have a better chance of actually reversing, halting the neuropathic process, but also identifying painful neuropathy early and managing it appropriately. So this is a possible way. Now, about guidelines, there are many guidelines. The American Diabetes Association say, if you don't have this sort of service, the best way to do is a measure of small fiber, which is using pinprick sensation, and also the tuning fork to uh, assess vibration sense. Um, this is better than nothing. It's better than monofilament. But clinical exam is not reproducible, even when it's done by, by experts. We invited me to the Mayo Clinic where we examined these people who were masked up on two occasions. These are experts from all over the world. At the extreme ends, he diagnosed neuropathy without any problem because it's either present or it's in the middle, uh, even renowned neurologists uh, like Dave would have difficulty actually identifying somebody who has, who has, so it wasn't reproducible. So we need to move, confirmed neuropathy has to be using objective measures such as nerve conduction and a measure of small fiber. And we need to take neuropathy uh, assessment. It has to be done by outside the general practice. So the general practitioner should get the results of this instead of spending an hour to try and do this in a very busy service. So that's what we're doing. It's done in, by nurses in the, and podiatrists in these hubs. And the GP, the immediately everything is entered into the computer on the day. It's immediately available to the general practitioner. And the general practitioner then can act in, in treating the, the pain or uh, referring the patient for a podiatry service if they have uh, neuropathy. Sounds like a great mm. system, Solomon. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Andrew, did you have a comment to make? Well, just a, a quick uh, comment to Solomon. <laughs> I agree. For example, the NICE guidance here is particularly unhelpful. Um, there are several pages on guidance for retinopathy screening. Uh, the guidance for neuropathy screening is use a 10 gram filament. That's it. One sentence. It doesn't tell you anything about normative data. It doesn't tell you how to use the filament, which isn't as easy as it sounds. Um, but I just worry about the practicality of all diabetics or people living with HIV or people going through a screening performed in secondary care, um, where in reality it's probably going to continue to be developed, delivered in primary care. These are general practice hubs. Okay. The hubs are in big practices. In Sheffield, we have really huge practices where we learned a great deal from the um, immunization. So these practices are not small surgeries, okay. really big surgeries. So when patients are, come in and they have their eyes drops put in, while the drop is working, it takes 20 minutes. Patients can't read uh, because you know, their eye is dilating. 
So we take them to another room and attack them. Sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and take shoes and socks off and examine properly and assess uh, their. So it is a system. It's like, uh, yeah. and then that's immediately sent to the general practitioner. And, and it has to be systemic change. Otherwise, in the, in the UK at the moment, amputation rates are increasing. There are 20 amputations a day. This actually increased because diabetes is increasing. So 20 amputations a day. Diabetes UK has highlighted this. That is far too many amputations um, in a very developed country. So amputation rates are go going up, whereas retinopathy and blindness is going down. It's a simple, if you have to invest in this, and one amputation costs the NHS a lot of money, apart from obviously it's devastating psychologically, emotionally, um, and a loss of working for society. It's a huge burden to society and to the patients, to their relatives as well. But it's also extremely expensive. The biggest expense for diabetes comes from the diabetic foot. One billion NHS money goes into managing we have 20 foot clinics in Sheffield. That's not a mark of success. It's a mark of failure. We shouldn't be getting these clinics. These clinics were, we used to have one clinic in, um, when I was a, a, a registrar, because everybody was, had amputation. One ward was full of amputations. We've taken that off, the big major amputations. But now what's happening is we've become, uh, we're, we're, we're almost, having nibbling, I call it, you know, we're taking toes, we're taking, it's still disabling, the patients spend lots of time coming into hospital, in and out, and we really, the best way to stop this is to identify, and the GP should be the gatekeeper for neuropathy, not the neurologist, not the pain specialist, not the diabetologist, the general practitioner should be the one that makes the diagnosis. If you look across Europe, uh, and this survey, it shows that 40% of diagnosis is done by the diabetologist. Um, around 20% is done uh, by neurologists. Pain specialists, slightly less. Uh, the, the GP, 26%. But all neuropathy should really be diagnosed at the level of the general practitioner, in my opinion. Uh, unless it is really very complex and very difficult. And my question was really to, to you and Dave is, um, mechanical sensory testing is, is fine, but we've shown in both HIV and leprosy that you pick up the neuropathies earlier with um, thermal sensory testing to warm detection thresholds. How practical is that to deliver in a primary care? Are we not there yet? I don't think we're there yet. Yeah. We, don't, we don't have that. I think we've got to be realistic. Um, yeah. I, I, I think Pinprick is, an, is a reasonable surrogate, and I, I quite like Solomon's model of a DPN check. Um, but no, I, I think I completely agree that we need to be engaging with primary care <laughs> as much as possible. Now, Andrew, very quickly, because uh, we are running through time, we, would you? So we, we've spoken about primary care and the role of diabetologists. What, what's the kind of patient that you would like to see referred up to your multidisciplinary pain clinic in no more than a minute? Okay, uh, <laughs> people, we can help. Um, my clinic and several others are somewhat unusual that we also provide diagnostic support to our neurology colleagues by taking skin biopsies and performing sensory profiling. Um, I think we can provide information to our primary care and secondary care specialists around what's worked, but I, I suspect one of the groups we need to see are people who need their medication rationalised. Um, um, and, and then secondly, uh, I think we can... Um, uh, provide information and support, provide a supportive environment to exactly what um, Fiona was talking about, people who actually understand and empathise with neuropathic pain. Um, we can provide niche treatments that are only available in clinics, so capsaicin 8%, botulinum toxin injection, perhaps uh, implanted neuromodulation devices, although I think as we've just published through Cochrane, the evidence supporting those is somewhat shaky at the moment. Um, but the other thing I would emphasize, and, and perhaps less positively, is that access to pain clinics is patchy. It's a, a diagnosis, it's a postcode lottery, uh, and our practices are very variable. Um, uh, so Fiona told you um, that she was offered ketamine infusions, which is certainly not something 
uh, we would consider. So we, we need to raise our own standards first. Um, uh, and perhaps we can talk about multidisciplinary um, options a, a little bit later on. But um, OK, I'll, I'll, um, I will come back. I think re uh, niche treatments, diagnostics, and um, uh, rationalization of medications. We often see patients coming with three or four medications, none of which are working. And Fiona, I'm just curious. So we've spoken about these different different levels, primary care, specialist <laughs> clinics. I mean, it sounds like you struggled a bit in your own journey to, to try and get that overall care package mm. that, that you needed. Yes. Is that true? Well, um, and listening to what Solomon had to, to say, I, uh, I wonder whether it's something peculiar coming, coming out of uh, an oncology department where uh, you sometimes feel that, okay, I mean, you've saved my life. I, I can't go back to you with these little niggly pains and, and I... Um, well, the, re the referrals and the callbacks are getting shorter and shorter, so people uh, are now not being followed up after two years because they believe that patients will spot recurrences um, more easily themselves. Yeah. Um, I managed to stay on, on the books, if you like, for, for seven years, so I was able to make more of a nuisance of, of myself. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I think, and I have spoken to so many people, I've heard it so often, that I can't go back to them with, with the, these pains in in my foot or, or these sensations or this numbness because you know they're so busy trying to deal with active cancers from other people where do where do I go so you either just don't bother telling anyone and you sort of live with it and you're grateful that you're still alive or you get a referral um, to the neurologist or to the pain department or you go back to primary care and then if you're lucky they might refer you on and then you've got uh, this long, long circular wait, and you have to go back to the beginning all over again. And um, my experience of records being passed between departments uh, is not very good. Records being passed between hospitals is practically non-existent. Yeah. And going to different hospitals, I have physically gone down with an armful of, of paper to my best contact at, in, in oncology and saying, I want you to know what's been going on. Here it is. And that they have said, well, of course, everything's digitized now. If we ever find somebody who can scan all this through, then it would be on your records. I just, We've all been there, okay. unfortunately. Yes, I'm, 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 <laughs> so um, experiences, and you mentioned postcode lottery, of, of yeah. course, yeah. that is going to play a huge part. So. Yeah, the, the, there are so many things way outside of, of the sort of clinical research that's going on. Thanks, Fiona. So maybe just in the last phase, we'll, we'll move a bit towards management. So, so Solomon, what do you think is in terms of the optimal pharmacological management of neuropathic pain? I think that's a, a very good question. I think when you see a patient who comes with painful neuropathy, it's, it's very important to have an empathic approach um, to listen to their expression instead of predetermined, do you have these, do you have these, do you have these? Well, listen to the patient, it's very, very important. Let them come up with the words and they'll give you a, a good description. Um, it's important to uh, listen not just to the pain, also how they feel. Many patients will feel a little guilty, particularly in diabetes. The period of poor control led to their predicament You've got to say to them, well, what's gone is gone. You've got to look to the future. Uh, many patients have false beliefs. They think they're going to have an amputation. Actually, if they have good foot pulses, neuropathic pain will not kill you. And authoritative dismissal of this sometimes is quite empowering for the patients. So spend a bit of time, listen to the patient. Um, and the first thing is that the painkillers, whatever you're going to give them, is not going to kill the pain completely. And I think it's very important. I always say to them, we'll reduce the pain, hopefully, with these medications that we'll prescribe. But we've got to be, you know, so a, a realistic sort of, it's not going to turn it, the pain. But don't let realistic stop you from really trying to stop the pain completely. Um, but also, we want an improvement in functionality in the patient. And patients who are unable to walk, you know, sleep to be better. They're, hopefully, they will feel a little better as well, emotionally. So these are the uh, objectives of the, the management. 
Broadly, we have nice approves of uh, these three lines of drugs, the gabapentinoids, pregabaline, gabapentin, amitriptyline, and deloxetine. And these are the first line drugs. Um, we have to tailor them to the individual patient. Um, we have to look at if they have comorbid conditions that you shouldn't prescribe that particular drug. Somebody has quite arrhythmias and history of cardiovascular disease. Don't give, uh, you know, if they have postural hypertension, do not give the TCAs. Um, if they have leg edema, don't give pregabalin or gab gabapentin. If they have liver disease, do not give deloxetine. So you need to look at those. Uh, at, 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 and these are the first line drugs. Intuitively, what we do in, in clinical care is we combine them with each other. The evidence for this is a little poor. Um, in fact, some guidelines, like the NUPSIC guidance, the uh, even NICE say switch rather than combine, because there isn't enough evidence. But from the trial that uh, all three of us have taken, the Option DM trial, which is not published yet, we found that combination treatment actually offers better, uh, better treatment than high-dose uh, monotherapy. So combination treatment, if, as long as you titrate the drug slowly from starting at a lower dose, gradually increasing, not giving too long an appointment to the patient, six months, we'll see you six months, that's not good enough. You've got to follow up or make sure there is, in Sheffield, we tend to phone them, see how, how you, are you, are you feeling okay? And if they're feeling okay, then we increase the dose. Uh, if, if they're having side effect, we change. So this should be happening in the, in, in, within the next few weeks. And uh, giving each drug um, to a reasonable amount, not just stopping at, you know, so maximum tolerated dose, uh, for a reasonable period, two to four weeks is what I say. So these are important principles. Um, what do we do then? Um, um, other things that we need to think about are um, the cost of the drugs, etc. Because in the old days, there was a huge difference in terms of, in fact, the drugs are equivalent. The option DM trial has shown that all three drugs, we couldn't separate them, pregabalin, deloxin, yeah, uh, um, and uh, yeah. well, absolutely equivalent. Um, and uh, the combinations were also absolutely equivalent. There were less discontinuations in the pregabalin arm. It appears a little bit uh, tolerated, but actually you couldn't separate these drugs. Um, what happens if they've tried these drugs and they haven't worked and the patient continues to have pain? Um, what we do in, in Sheffield is we, some, some patients, we uh, refer for a capsaicin 8% patch. We don't have that service in, in, in Sheffield, so we send it to, um, sometimes I send it to London. Praveen Anand is a friend of mine, and he works, he's a professor at Imperial College. He's a colleague of uh, uh, Andrew. Um, and, and also, we, also some patients we refer to for spinal cord stimulation. Um, these are really at the end of their tether. Who, uh, we did a, a big, a smallish study, 10 patients only, which were published many years ago in The Lancet the, for the first time in, in neuropathic pain. This was when I was working in Liverpool many years in 1996. Um, but recently, there have been, in, in painful diabetic neuropathy, there have been uh, a, a one big study with 100 patients. In, uh, but it's, blinding is impossible with these uh, studies, but this was favorable. Um, and uh, this is high frequency spinal cord stimulation. So we do refer some patients to leads for this form of treatments. An expensive treatment, but it is approved by NICE. Um, obviously, more research needs to be done in this field. So that's how we manage. Um, another impact is psychology, and, and it's very important. Many patients, um, we, we did a small study on acceptance and commitment therapy, and this is this form of therapy is that the pain will be there. But what, what helps the patients to do is to leave the pain on one side and take interest in something that's important to them, their grandchildren, something that's, and, and to focus outside. And so the pain, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the uh, six or eight will not change, you know, as, as Fiona beautifully put it, but actually they learn to cope with the pain better. And now there is going to be, uh, we're planning a big trial across Europe. Um, there is a web-based ACT therapy, and there is group-based ACT therapy, and also control group where we just give 
education only, and we want to compare if patients can get some benefit from this form of treatment. Great, thank you, Solomon. I mean, I, I think it, from my own personal experience, I think communication, again, with primary care is incredibly important. So it's not unusual for someone in secondary care to recommend pregabalin amitriptyline, but without really good guidance about dose titration, what side effect to look out for, what to do if that medication doesn't work. And I think that's so, so important. And managing the expectation of patients. Yeah. We often see people who are put on these drugs not told what the aim is, which is to reduce their pain, yeah. perhaps other sensory symptoms such as itch. They are sometimes come with the impression it's going to cure their neuropathy. Or, so it's a, yeah. Um, or, or, or the fact they're coming with the expectation that the pain is going to completely dis disappear, yeah. whilst actually what you're trying to achieve is basically functionally, some, something that's functionally improving the life of that patient, which, which you know, in many cases we're not going to be able to completely treat the pain. Yeah, Fiona. And... Also, as, as I mentioned before, that, uh, that all-important aspect of the patient feeling that they have been able to communicate their pain uh, yeah. in a way that is honest and authentic for them and to feel that they are being understood. And there is that moment when you know that you've been uh, understood. Um, it, it's absolutely vital, as it, being understood or not, are the, the key moments in, in my experience um but also um the distraction if you like uh, techniques the possibilities um are enormously helpful but there's another side too where uh you can learn not to say you know there's the pain over there and and this is me and you know never the twain shall uh, discuss but actually um getting to know your your pain understanding it learning not uh in a sense, to, to manage it as some sort of naughty teenager. But, but this yeah. is how you are. And you know, one thing that I have is a, um, a photograph of myself as an oh-so-sweet little four-year-old, you know, pr pretty dress, sandals, and those are the same legs, those are the same feet. You know, look at this long journey that we've had together. That There are so many ways, and, and also the expression of the arts, whether it's in writing or the visual arts or f photography, um, being able to do something that helps you to express something that is not a 6.2 or a 7.3. Absolutely. Uh, and did you just want to end on the added value of a multidisciplinary pain clinic? Yeah, I mean, just very quickly, um, one of the big successes of, of pain management over the past 30 years has been the adoption of the biopsychosocial approach. And from that comes multidisciplinary um, pain management programmes. One of the challenges in neuropathic pain is whilst this has been very successful for musculoskeletal pain, for example, people who come to my colleagues uh, with low back pain, chronic low back pain, will see, first of all, an interdisciplinary, so an advanced from multidisciplinary team of a pain physician, a psychologist, a physiotherapist, and a surgeon, and then between them and, and in collaboration with the patient, uh, their, their sort of plan will be... Um, uh, developed. One of the problems in neuropathic pain is that it almost remains a multidisciplinary free zone and we focused entirely on the bio and pharmacological treatments and that may be to a certain extent around the marketing of certain medicines that have been developed. And Maya Kalpur as well as Solomon, we published the clinical trials on those drugs and the overemphasis on that without, as Fiona has been alluded to, looking at the bio and the psychosocial. But one of the problems with current pain management programs is the philosophy is that they're often agnostic of the cause of the pain. And I believe that to be an error because most pain management programs are designed around musculoskeletal conditions and have physical um, pacing goals and things like that. So together with Whitney Scott in, H in the field of HIV neuropathy, we formed a program of research where we've tried to ascertain what is important for people living with neuropathic pain and design pain management programs specifically for their need. And for HIV, they're now available, or they will be available online. So it has a lot to offer, but we're a long way behind our musculoskeletal pain colleagues. A long way. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Well, I, I think unless we've got any final words from the panel, that, that concludes our discussion. Uh, we're going to now take some questions, both from Slido, but we're also we're going to have two microphones. I think we've got one either side. Uh, I'll start with the online questions and then we'll move to the microphones. 
Um, there's a couple of questions that I have for you guys if, if we're short, but hopefully we won't be. Uh, so, Andrew, maybe one for you. Some patients mention that weather affects their neuropathic pain. Is there any scientific reason for this? Um, that's not... It, 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 I recognise it, absolutely. Um, and it, but it's not exclusive to neuropathic pain. It, it's a common phenomenon in, in, in many chronic pains. Um, and whilst we recognise it, uh, we don't particularly uh, understand it, except in some very specific conditions. So Dave and I in particular have worked on a, a condition called non-freezing cold injury, which cost you guys about £50 million pounds over the past five years. Uh, and it's particularly restricted to um, uh, uh, um, military personnel. Uh, it's basically tr uh, um, trench foot. Um, and particularly troops of Afro-Caribbean or Pacific Island ethnicity are susceptible to it. And they get this localized neuropathy where their uh, symptoms are particularly triggered by exposure to fairly modest cold. And then Dave works on another condition called erythromyalgia, where the patients are often, the symptoms are triggered by, by warm environments. Now those are two sort of extreme ends of that spectrum, uh, but by studying those conditions, we can begin to understand um, uh, what are the, the environmental triggers uh, for, for pain. Um, but in general, we recognize it, but don't understand it, say in the context of, of, of diabetic neuropathy, it's, it's, un, it's not well understood but it's well recognized at the moment. I'm sure we all are, remember our grandmothers talking about how, how they could feel when their lumbago was coming on or something like that, because the weather was getting damp. Thank you. Uh, Solomon, maybe one for you. What emerging treatments could you highlight, please? Emerging treatments? Um, well, there well, aren't really major emerging treatments at the moment. Um, I mean, there are there have been a few that uh, uh, sort of eighty two your angiotensin uh, two receptor uh, inhibitor. The, a number, but most of them come on to phase two. And over the, over the years, we've tried at least tens of uh, um, aldose reductase inhibitors, all sorts of drugs that are being given. Um, vitamins, all sorts of drugs, but actually nothing has really worked as a disease modifying. And the one that's promising is the uh, Andrews, uh, um, you know, that, that compound that you published on. Um, cannabis, we did try in Sheffield, we did a clinical trial and there was a, uh, a big trial also around the UK, um, but unfortunately uh, there was no difference. There was improvement Everybody improved, <laughs> and I think people were hyped up, you know, when he when he mentioned the cannabis. Um, so I can't think of any really at the moment that is a, a great candidate to. Okay, uh, Andrew, I think you've got I just to briefly to uh, cannabis <laughs> and cannabinoids are very very topical. Um, I've just had the privilege of chairing a three and a half year evidence appraisal of that, and I wish it was otherwise because I I spent 10 years of my preclinical career um, elucidating the endogenous cannabinoid system, but the clear evidence at the moment is that there is no benefit to cannabinoids in any form of chronic pain, uh, and there are serious concerns about adverse effects. Um, one thing I'd like to emphasize with Solomon's discussion too, we focus all the time on the pharmacological therapies, but there are other therapies out there that are non-pharmacological, and we're trying to understand those and bring them into the picture, again, a multidisciplinary approach. It's not all about pharmacology, um, is, is one of the things I would say. I'm just going to say one thing about disease-modifying therapy. So there, there are select examples in the neuropathy field of recent success, and probably the best one is familial amyloid neuropathy, which, which is a very disabling condition. It relates to a mutation in a gene called transthyretin. Uh, it could cause... Uh, very severe pain, severe autonomic dysfunction, and what happens is a mutant form of amyloid is forms a protein that's deposited in nerve, but also other organs in the body, such as the heart, with a very high mortality rate. And we've recently had successful gene therapy uh, for familial amyloid neuropathy, uh, which 
a, a number of different gene therapy approaches have shown that you can really very significant effects and reduce the progression <coughs> of that neuropathy, and that's now licensed for treatment. So I, I think I, do, I just want to say that uh, I definitely don't think pharmacology is always the answer, but we are seeing uh, some select advances, a very significant understanding of peripheral neuropathy that's actually translated into treatments that's making big difference to the lives uh, of patients. So I just thought that was a good example. Another emerging, I don't know whether it's emerging treatment, is transcranial stimulation, um, uh, sort of magnetic stimulation. And uh, work from Didier Boisira, he, he's a, a pain specialist, a neurologist as well uh, from uh, Paris. And they published a paper in Brain. It's so actually placebo controlled trial, and over six months they showed um, clear benefit um, of this approach for patients with painful uh, diabetic, painful neuropathies, uh, and, and other neuropathies as well, I think. Yeah. So that's another area. The equipment we don't have would be nice if we could borrow and actually do, if we can reproduce it. It's not a trivial equipment that it's, you would it's, need it's, it's to massive, do that. Yeah, and also it, patients would need to come into a centre. Yeah. But, but it's, it's only it's very interesting, and the mechanism is interesting. And, and you know, I, I think one of the positives is many fewer side effects compared to some of the medications, but it, it wouldn't be easy to deliver uh, clinically. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a trivial intervention, but it's not implanted like some other neuromodulation techniques. And one of the important things about Didier's Buhasira's trial was that it was placebo-controlled trial. Uh, and we've recently shown in a Cochrane review that for other forms of neuromodulation, spinal cord stimulation, for example, uh, there appears to be a large effect size, but as soon as you introduce a placebo-controlled trial, pretty much all that effect disappears. Uh, and that's not the case for magnetic, transcranial magnetic stimulation, but we don't have the kit in the UK uh, just yet. So, I, mean, I, I think it's while. important to say that any kind of intervention in the management of pain that you want to assess in a clinical trial, one of the real challenges is I, I mean, the placebo effect, which, which is people's expectation uh, that this treatment is going to work for them, which has a powerful influence on your pain perception. It really just taps into uh, what's called an endogenous pain modulatory system that we all have, and that, that relates to you know, the fact that pain is quite dynamic and in a way the brain selects the upward signals from uh, the spinal cord. And that, that is something that is a challenge in clinical trials and, and it affects surgical measures such as spinal cord uh, stimulation as much as, as medical trials as well. So, Andrew, this is a question I'm going to give to you. and I'm going to slightly amend the question because actually there's one issue I do want to bring up. So the question is, does ketamine have a role in neuropathic pain management? And I'm afraid I'm going to double the question. I'm going to say, does ketamine and do strong opioids have a role in your, okay. I, I think we have to tackle the opioid issue because yep. it's such a, it's a really <laughs> important issue worldwide for pain management. So I'm gonna, you, maybe you could start um, by saying does ketamine have a role and then maybe move on to do strong opioids have a role? Mm -hmm. And if, if they do, who should be prescribed? Yes, them? ketamine or ketamine infusions. The last time we looked, there was no robust evidence that would allow me to, to routinely use it in our clinical service. And it has side effects, as you were told. Opioids. If you haven't read the book, uh, the one, I can't remember which prize it won last year, Empire of Pain, do so. It's truly frightening. Currently being serialised on Radio 4 at the moment. Oh, is it? Not, it's, <laughs> it's actually, if you, um, if you but, like podcasts, it's a very good um, podcast. The way these drugs were marketed, the way they penetrated the FDA um, is sobering. Um, we certainly don't recognize, recommend opioids for the treatment of chronic pain. There's no evidence that they have prolonged effects, and there's now serious evidence as, as to their usefulness. And in fact, I've probably prescribed opioids maybe three or four times in my career, which as of this month is 40 years. Um, there is an important issue there in that they were widely prescribed, and there are a lot of people, um, particularly in my area, the HIV area, who are now living with very high doses of opioids. And how you get them off them is a really challenging question. So we felt the only approach to that is it's primarily an addiction medicine problem. And all the pain physician can offer really is collaboration to offer alternative methods of pain control. Um, and we had a funded service at Chelsea and Westminster, but unfortunately the, the addiction psychiatrist retired uh, and she, we haven't been able to replace her. Um, so 
quite a lot of what pain clinics actually do these days is, is trying to take patients off opioids, uh, which seems a little bit counterintuitive, but they're, certainly they don't work for chronic pain and certainly they're dangerous. Uh, and we certainly wouldn't advocate their use in any way. So I, I definitely think one of the messages of today is extreme caution in initiating opioid yeah. prescribing for and chronic pain. It needs a lot of education. There's often a lot of pressure on the medical professional because quite rightly people are saying, I'm desperate, this pain is ruining my life. But, but opioids generally are not the answer other than some very select cases. And I yeah. never prescribe them as a neurologist. Very occasionally I might refer on to the pain clinic and we might have a discussion, yeah. but I, I never initiate them myself. And sadly... We seem to be going down the same route with regards to the cannabinoids. We get uh, a lot of pressure to prescribe them. It's actually an even more dangerous situation because at least the opioids were within the medicines regulatory procedure system. For reasons I simply don't comprehend, uh, the medical cannabis area has been allowed to circumvent those uh, safeguards in many countries, particularly the USA. So recently, uh, uh, the American Diabetes Association and American Academy of Neurology guidelines have pretty much, I wouldn't want to use the word banned, but uh, uh, sort of stop using the, the, the latest guidance from 2021, 2022, respectively, uh, doesn't recommend opioids for the management of painful diabetic neuropathy. Uh, Long-term opioid use is connected with increased mortality, um, and uh, in particular in the States, as, as Andrew mentioned, it's a really huge opioid crisis. Okay, so I think we've fully covered that topic, hopefully. <laughs> we feel um, strongly about it. <laughs> yeah, you can tell we all feel strongly about it, because I, I think we've seen the, the very real problems Damage, that, that yeah. can, all, all of us in our clinics, that, that are associated with strong opioid prescribing. Um, so there's an interesting question here, maybe Andrew, one for you. It's a difficult question. What's the best way of objectively monitoring response to treatment in a clinical setting? For neuropathic pain in particular. Well, first of all, pain, we can't measure pain. Yep. Uh, either in experimental animals, in the preclinical or in people. It, it's a complex um, thing that can only be reported to the patient. So first of all, we have to listen to the patients. Uh, there are some tools that are a little bit useful. I'm sorry, it's a questionnaire, Fiona. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but there is something called the neuropathic pain symptom inventory, which follows on from one of the diagnostic questionnaires that actually tries to quantify um, uh, many of the aspects of neuropathic pain. And you can use that to monitor change uh, in response to uh, other interventions. I would say it's a little bit light on the burden side. It, it rather focuses on the biological side, but it's, it's a not a bad tool. And we certainly use it routinely in our clinic. It's 10 questions. Um, um, uh, and it quantifies the responses. But they're naught to 10 scales, and we all understand the limitations of those. So a lot of emphasis in the pain world uh, about trying to understand what the burden of pain is and how we can more comprehensively and holistically account for that. And another interesting area that's come out, and Fiona, we've discussed this several times, is every patient has a different burden. So what's interesting to a 25-year-old soldier who has non-freezing cold injury or a 95-year-old who's living with very long-term diabetic neuropathy or post neuralgia, their goals are very different. Um, and I think it's important to contextualise and individualise those at the beginning of any, mm. any uh, um, relationship with a patient. Would you? Yes. yes, absolutely. It goes back to what I was saying about being understood uh, and not just uh, through the descriptions of pain, uh, the, uh, the descriptions of the sensations of, of pain, but uh, what is it preventing that person from doing? Yes. Is it as basic as being able to pick up their young child? Uh, does it enable uh, that person to, to earn their living? Uh, what, you know, what, are, what are the key areas and, and what's appropriate? in that situation and, and feeling understood and, and finding a, a pathway that will enable that as much as is possible and to feel that you're working on it as a, as a team, that, that you've got some goals and that you will find different ways. Thank you. Solomon, did you have something to add? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think we need, to, it's very difficult at the moment, but I, we've done a little bit of work over the past few years, some of it not published, part of PhDs, 
And what we found was if you give gadolinium <clears throat> in the arm, it's a contrast agent. And you look at the flow of blood through the thalamus, a very important pain processing area. Most of our sensation goes through the thalamus before it's forward to the somatosensory cortices. What we found was uh, the using uh, um, MR perfusion imaging is we found that in normal individuals without uh, neuropathic pain, non-diabetic, um, pretty fast exit through the thalamus. Diabetic people without neuropathy, very similar, almost identical. Even. In those with um, painless neuropathy, there was sluggish blood flow. Uh, but in those with painful neuropathy, the thalamus was engorged with blood. Um, and this was published in Diabetes Care. <clears throat> and then following on that, the numbers were small. We had a bigger study, which uh, just completed uh, and Damani uh, Greg and, um, uh, we, we, as a part of a PhD, which was really interesting. This time, we used similar, but we had bigger numbers. And what we found is that during the resting state, those that have pain have a faster uh, time to peak concentration. It's called TTP in the thalamus. Um, uh, those with pain, but those that didn't have pain while they were in the scan had a much, uh, you know, much less uh, uh, speed in terms of TTP. There was a very clear daylight between the groups. But then when you challenge them with uh, a burning pain, um, a sort of a, a, a exogenous pain, the capacity of the um, thalamus to increase blood flow in those with pain is actually limited. Whereas normal healthy volunteers, when you give them a painful stimulus, huge rise in blood flow in the thalamus. So I think um, this sort of imaging work, and this is not sort of functional imaging, this is something you measure and uh, pretty objective, could might in the future with bigger numbers, multi-center studies, we might have something that would approximate so that to know what the patient is going through when they have pain. And so it seems very promising. We, we haven't published this work yet. Um, and what another chap, Gordon Sloan, again working with me, who just finished his PhD as well, is he looked at uh, phosphorus spectroscopy, which measures energy consumption um, and uh, in, in the mitochondria, in the uh, thalamus. What he showed is actually those in pain, in a great deal of pain, have greater energy consumption compared with those that are not in pain. So it looks like um, the, the, the analogy I have is in, when you have pain, the, the, like London is gridlocked with the traffic, uh, which is consuming a lot of uh, energy. But actually, the capacity, if, if you, if you, the capacity of top-down inhibition is limited because um, um, although it has big, bigger, greater blood flow, it's actually it's not able to mount a response um, is the analogy I have. And some work you've done uh, up, uh, at uh, MRI scans in Oxford also shows that maybe this will give us uh, over the next 10 years or so some idea of what's happening in the brain when people are in pain and when they're not. I mean, I certainly think that there's ongoing work on using brain imaging as, as a biomarker. I, I, I don't think it will ever completely... I think pain is very personal and, yeah. and we don't yet know the basis of consciousness. So I don't think it will ever fully replace personal report of pain. But I, I do think it can be helpful to look at the neural circuitry underlying pain. And I, I, there's some evidence that you might be a useful kind of intermediate when you're kind of doing proof of concept studies in clinical trials before stepping up to do those very large kind of phase three trials. Andrew, a question for you, uh, which is an interesting one. Are there some specific differences in a neuropathic pain management program as opposed, as opposed to a musculoskeletal pain management program? It's a great question. Um, I'm getting all the tough ones through that. I'm, I'm saving that for you. <laughs> um, so musculoskeletal-based pain management programs have, have been are now well-established. Not always beloved of uh, uh, clinical commissioners because they're quite expensive, but I would argue that the value for money they provide when well done is good. One of the problems they have is actually um, keeping the effect going afterwards and, and how people are beginning to look at that. Uh, neuropathic pain management programs are, are very much in their infancy. 
Um, they're not well established around the country. Now, many of my psychology colleagues would argue that you should be agnostic about the type of pain. Um, and therefore, a, a pain management program for musculoskeletal pain is just as good for people with neuropathic pain. I would argue strongly that that's not the case, um, that you need to set specific goals. In fact, we may even need to be individualizing mm -hmm. those goals. One of the problems with pain management programs is they're a bit too generic. Um, so it's early days. Um, I think one thing we've learned over the last two years is that actually delivering those in groups of people who come to hospital is not very efficient and is not the best way of doing it. And there are huge opportunities around um, uh, virtual based programs um, that I think many people are exploiting. Um, so early days, my belief is that they're, they're not the same thing and you need to be less generic about them. But if there's a psychologist in the room who wants to disagree with me, absolutely please do. Please do. Um, Actually, there's a, there's a follow-on question which, which I'll take, which I, th I think kind of follows on a bit from what you're saying, which is, is there any role for virtual reality in the management of neuropathic pain? I think that's really interesting, and, and Ben Seymour, who's based in Oxford, is kind of working along that idea. So I think we will see more digital technologies yeah. being employed in the management of pain. And I think, you know, given the improvement in digital technologies, this is going to be an evolving area. And for instance, he's interested in maladaptive learning processes in, in the development of neuropathic pain. And so he's trialing some of these virtual reality environments. Um, I, I don't think we have the data yet to prove that they're effective, but certainly they're being developed. And my gut feeling is this could be, you know, really helpful in amplifying the way that we manage pain, because if we can make these digital technologies, and potentially we could even personalize them, as Andrew's saying. Um, did you want to add well, no, that, we, we've just published a trial in pain with Finnish colleagues looking at the same thing. It's quite an yeah. interesting process. They first came to me, the technologists, by saying, we want to develop virtual reality programs for pain. Now, they do actually work around um, very <laughs> acute pain, people having dressings change for burns. Uh, but I said, no, this is a very personal thing. It's about the burden of pain. What you need to look at is, is, is function around pain. And to their credit, they took the ball and ran, or probably in Finland, the ice hockey puck and skated would be a better analogy. Um, and we had a, a, a wonderful situation where we had people who knew how to do clinical trials combined with the enthusiastic technologists. And what we've shown is that if you look at um, virtual reality to decrease the burden of pain or, or improve the functioning, uh, uh, that is probably the approach you need. Now, it might be a subtle distinction, but it's one that we feel is important. Um, and um, we're, we're moving forward with that, with that program now. Um, one of the advantages of it is you can adapt the programs to the, to the situation of the individual person at least in theory, their home or their work mm. environment, for example. Yeah. And actually, I mean, maybe thinking about work environment, another question is, is there a role for social prescribing, brackets, drug-free, question mark, in pain? I mean, it's an interesting idea, but I'm not yeah. sure it's ever been tested. That, I'm not sure that it's been tested. It's an important idea. I don't know whether... Mm. Yeah. Um, from what I've heard... Um, uh, both from people who, who are within the social prescribing program um, yeah. and people aiming to benefit from it, that there, there's a, a good degree of, of wanting to see where it might go because it, it's really sort of in its infancy. And there's, um, I think, a lack of information between, say, primary care and the ben benefits of particular therapies and therapies as opposed to therapists um, who, who are trained to deal with uh, issues arising from it. Um, but, you know, we were talking earlier about distraction techniques. I was talking about being with your pain. I, th I think that it's a very interesting way forwards, and I think we should be looking at all the different experiences that, that exists, as you were saying, to perhaps look at personalizing it, um, Great. limited only by funding, I'm sure. Uh, I think one of the areas where social prescribing, where we do have more confidence, is around muscular, chronic musculoskeletal pain and uh, exercise programs, for example. Um, but again, neuropathic yeah. pain is somewhat behind the, the curve on that. Mm. 
We've had a lot of questions from Slido. Are there any questions from the room? Okay, so could we pass the microphones over? And you've got one, so maybe we could pre prepare Oh, there's, I think this gentleman here actually next. We'll come to you next, I'm sorry. So there was a question so, over here. Let, there we go. I, I was an oncologist once, and so I probably caused some <laughs> a painful neuropathies, um, although the drugs that mostly do that came in after my time. Um, secondly, I am now leading a programme on diagnostics at um, NHS England, so I would love to talk to Solomon afterwards about what you would like the, the national programme to do uh, on <coughs> foot pain in particular and, and peripheral neuropathy there for diabetes, um, because we've got this whole raft of community diagnostic centres being established um, and they could possibly be useful. My third question is that um, relates to the fact that I am a a sufferer um, from a niche cause, arachnoiditis, um, and it's unilateral. I've had all the, the niche treatments that you mentioned, most of which have worked, but not necessarily long term. In, uh, long term. Yeah. Um, and so whether I'm just a placebo responder, I, I never know. Um, but I suppose the question is, I would prefer numbness to pain. Um, is there anything that can be done that, that would create more permanent numbness rather than pain? Because when I've had local anaesthetic put in, it's lovely for a few hours. Yeah, um, I recognise that. Um, uh, local anaesthetics are actually quite a cruel thing to do to some patients because you can take their pain away for a few hours uh, and then they disappear. So the history of this is that both surgeons and anaesthetists, and actually we've, we've just finished a, quite a big programme of looking at um, over a very long period of time, what happened to people with uh, post-amputation pain who were injured in the First World War. And we've looked back through their pension and medical records and various things. Um, and, and these cycles go through of people performing lesion procedures, whether it's surgeons or anaesthetists injecting phenol or whatever into a nerve, and they don't work in the long term and they probably cause more damage than harm. But we see them recycling every 20 years or so. Um, uh, the numbness one is interesting. Actually, I'm going to approach that from a different angle. When we see patients, it's really interesting to, or important to ask, actually, or listen, rather, <coughs> um, to what they're telling you about their symptoms. Because some people will describe pain as, or numbness as pain or an unpleasant sensation. Other patients have it. Other patients have, particularly with chemotherapy-induced neuropathy, um, uh, painful dysesthesia. And they're all subtly different. And it's really important to try and understand what the patient is actually telling you about. And why is it important? It's important because the drugs we have, whilst they're not perfect, are much better at dealing with some things like itch or pain than they are dealing with numbness. So it would be erroneous, uh, erroneous in our prescribing if we were prescribing gabapentin, for example, to treat numbness. Um, you, find, you might find numbness less distressing, but there are some patients who find it more distressing. Um, and that's been our experience with some of the military patients as well. We've got a question over here. Can I ha ask for a very succinct question and a succinct answer as well? Because we're running tight on time. Far away. Um, a very common problem is the older patients who have developed diabetes before, they get better. Suddenly, they develop, commonly develop spinal stenosis. Spinal stenosis. The pain somehow disappears. Then they have problem of walking, unsteadiness, falling down. We have a problem of discriminating, which is causing problem, whether diabetes, even though it's reasonably, reasonably controlled, or the stenosis. Then we send them for MRI scanning. The MRI scanning is not very, say, this is that, this is that, you know. In your opinion, <coughs> panelists, what do you think we should do? Because the combination of epic begins spinal stenosis and diabetes. I'm going to answer that as a neurologist. I think it's important to remember that often patients with diabetes have multiple morbidities uh, and be clinically alive to the fact that they may have diabetic neuropathy coexisting with other neurological disorders that can cause weakness and pain and sensory loss. I think there's no simple answer to what you've said. It's going to depend on the clinical presentation. There are some features of uh, spinal stenosis that may help you clinically, for instance, pain that's brought on by exercise and relieved by rest. 
but you're going to have to look at every situation in, in its clinical context. I don't think it's going to be realistic to do an MRI scan on anyone. I think it's like any clinical problem, uh, you need to be live to the clinical scenarios. So there's a, you had a question, didn't you? So can we please give the microphone to the gentleman here, and I'm going to take a question from, from over there. Maybe there. If the gentleman was first, so I, and we're running out of time. So quick question from back there, please. Do we no, it's a gentleman, and then it's going to be you. Do we think that all pain is the same? Is the pain from diabetic neuropathy the same pain that you get with trigeminal neuralgia, that you get with herpetic neuralgia, that you get with leprosy? Are we dealing with the same physiology, the same pharmacology, or do we think that there may be differences in all these pains? I'm actually going to answer that really quickly. I'm very strongly of the opinion that there's strong that there's heterogeneity. That, that neuropathic pain is not one single entity, and the and there will be some mechanisms that cut across these different disorders. But there are likely some that are different. The physiology tells us that. The pharmacology is also can be quite different. Not always, but for instance, the treatment of trigeminal neuralgia respond very well to carbamazepine, which is pretty ineffective in many other conditions. If you've got a quick addition. Super, super quick. Um, neuropathic pain broadly comes in three flavors, mm -hmm. and they can exist isolated or, or combined in the same patient. Trigeminal neuralgia is what we call paroxysmal pain. It occurs in attacks. Mm -hmm. Diabetic neuropathy is often characterized by constant burning pain in their mm -hmm. feet, and other patients have what we call evoked pain. Um, so very light touching of the skin can cause pain. And all of those can present in a single case, but some of them are more common in some syndromes than another. So trigeminal neuralgia, almost always characterized by paroxysmal pain, diabetic neuropathy, almost always by burning, burning pain in the feet. Um, but it's important when you're assessing a patient to ask about all three. Question. Uh, I'd particularly like to thank Fiona for bringing out the CIP and chemotherapy in just peripheral neuropathy with I'm a carrier endocrinologist. I do research in small fiber neuropathy. But when I did research on CIPN, we had 90 odd patients. The amount of pre chemotherapy counseling done by oncologists, with all due respect to them, was minimal. It was very harsh reality on my part. I think our diabetes patients do much better than them. And when I presented my data at Chicago in the American Association of Clinical Oncology, believe me, I'm not making this up, there was just a shrug of shoulders. They just said, you know, it's part of therapy, you have to live with it. <coughs> what is the pain society doing to involve oncologists to be more aware of what they are imposing on patients? Yeah, I think this is very, very important. I think we need a huge public health no, no, uh, in front, in front. Uh, move to inform the, that neuropathic pain cuts across many conditions. It's, patients don't have anything to show for it sometimes. People don't believe them. Family members don't believe them. Huge publicity is required. We need a patient's organization. Uh, we need um, really big public health education on, on this, including doctors. Agreed. We need to advocate. So this is the last question of the night. Um, I, too, have had breast cancer. I was discovered at stage three. One of the chemos they gave me was Taxol, which was very painful and led to deadness in my feet very painful deadness. Um, I was, the drugs I was given was um, large quantities of vitamin B6 and reflexology. I've kept on with the reflexology. My left foot is slightly better, but my right foot is very dead and painful. Uh, I gave up higher shoes and I wear flat shoes now. And my balance has got worse and worse over the years. And I now walk with a stick because I'm terrified of falling. But I wasn't offered any of these drugs. And when I said to Professor Mockbell, who was my surgeon, uh, you know, is there nothing that can be done? And it was a shrug of the shoulders. Mm. Mm. Yeah, well, one lesson is we need to... So, signposting is really important. The vitamins issue is an important one because it was first described um, in Far East Prisoners of War. Um, uh, on the Burma Railway and things uh, with regard to nutritional deficiencies. They use Marmite to treat it, by the way. Um, but one of the problems is that we, we often see patients who are prescribed vitamins when they don't have a vitamin deficiency. Um, and that doesn't, to me, make a lot of sense. Um, yeah. 
Okay, I'm going to say thank you very much to our panel, absolutely. and thank you for a fantastic set of uh, questions, which I think have illuminated the day. Yeah, thank you. And we're just going to end with Jonathan Cropman, who's going to end the evening for us. Good evening, um, as late as it is. Well, President Kirby, I can't see where he is now, um, Chairman Professor Bennett, Fiona Talkington, Chief Executive Michelle Acton, Professor Wright, um, Wright and um, Professor Tess Fay. Uh, I'm honoured to be able to give this vote of thanks this evening on behalf of your guests, the audience. Um, I'm humbled by what I've heard because it is um, a really very, very uh, detailed subject, the mastery of which um, has been evident in what we've heard. Um, I'm representing the Allen and Sheila Diamond Charitable Trust, of which I'm a trustee, and as you've heard, which has made this evening's masterclass possible with its uh, support. Um, as we've heard, peripheral neuropathy is estimated to affect one in six, um, sorry, it's between six and eight percent of, of, of people over the age of uh, mid 50s. And um, we've also heard how prevalent it is in um, cancer-treated patients um, in diabetes and other um, conditions. Um, one thing I've been aware as a trustee of this charity, and for reasons I shall tell you in a moment, is that it is massively under-researched and not widely understood. For this charitable trust, that is a uh, very important topic of relevance. Uh, our charity chairman, Dr. Alan Diamond, has stoically suffered with peripheral neuropathy for many, many years. The charity that he and Sheila Diamond is here, um, founded many years ago, uh, uh, and which is focused on medical causes, welfare, education, dissemination of knowledge, became very involved in this field and has supported the University College of Osteopathy, which is a leader in the clinical understanding of this condition. And I see Vice Chancellor Hunt here. Indeed, um, the Charitable Trust has also sponsored a joint research program between the University College of Osteopathy and Imperial College, and this project is led by Professor Rice. Um, Alan and Sheila came to know um, the Royal Society of Medicine's executive director, Michelle Acton, um, during her time at Fight for Sight. They've been very involved in, in research and support, and they're delighted to be working with you, Michelle, again this evening at this class. Uh, they are only sorry, or Alan is only sorry, that he had to present his apologies uh, for not attending this evening. And uh, I'm sure everyone uh, will join me in wishing him, um, uh, sending him our best wishes. But what an inspiring masterclass this has been. Um, we've been very fortunate to hear Fiona talk about, uh, in really very graphic way, profoundly moving way of her, and, and, and very well illustrated way of, of, of her difficult treatment and challenges, and what she has learned about others suffering from these conditions. So I want to thank Fiona, thank our learned professors who so clearly explained um, their uh, approaches, different approaches, the work they do to understanding these conditions and the tremendous work they are undertaking, as well as answering some very searching questions, very technical and searching questions. Um, let's hope that the widening of knowledge will stimulate more research and most importantly, greater funding for the wonderful work that is being done and that perhaps we will hear of emerging treatments next time we hear our professors speak. Um, uh, and that one other thing that I think we've been very lucky to have um, that's emerged tonight, and I think it's been men mentioned, a group of people or leadership in disseminating knowledge would make a big difference to those who are sufferers so that there would be actually more enlightenment and for whatever treatment can be made or understanding. And I think that associations of sufferers are very important. I've seen it work as a layman in the Association of Osteopathic Patients. Um, oh, sorry, Osphagal Patients. 
people suffering from our stuff. Uh, I can't even say it. Anyway, look, if the quality and content of this presentation here were measures of achieving funding, with a measure of achieving funding, then we should be well on the road. And on behalf of all those attending and those who will come to watch the recording, thank you again to all the speakers and to the Royal Society of Medicine for hosting and making this evening available.